Church is greeted in the name of Christ. Amen. Happy Sabbath. I want to, to thank the Lord for such an opportunity to come and stand before his church on this Sabbath day, a day where we pause from all our cares of this world, both physically and mentally, just to learn from his word. What does the church say? Yes. Um, it's my first time to be here. So when I came here, I was observing. So there are certain people whom I saw. If you see me stammering, you must know that there are some people that I saw. Amen? Yes. But I'm also thinking about a certain text where God, through his servant Moses, was talking to the children of Israel, particularly the leaders. And he was telling them that as judges, they must not be concerned about the faces of the people. They must not be impartial. So don't worry. All right. I understand that today is Education Day. I'm going to be preaching from a text which we find in the book of Philippians. And my understanding of education is not going to be a secular one. Are we together, saints? Yes. I subscribe to the philosophy of Christian education. That is what I believe. So I'm going to be preaching about Christian education. I won't be talking about it exactly, but I'm going to be getting my own bias from that angle. Uh, the reason why we have a philosophy of Christian education, particularly as Seventh-day Adventist, is because we believe that we are the remnant church. And in everything that we do in this world before Christ comes, must reflect Christ in us. Are we together, saints? Yes. So, our education system as Seventh-day Adventists is derived from the Bible. Everything that we believe, if you go to Adventist schools, everything that we believe is biased towards the Bible. We don't believe in the theory of evolution. We don't believe and many other things that I'm going to touch in my sermon. So our worldview, the way we understand the world, is a bias towards the Bible. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 12 to verse number 14, is our preaching text, and it reads as follows. But I want you to know, brethren, that, sorry, verse number 9 to 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and the praise of God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you this morning for such a wonderful opportunity to come before your throne of grace and mercy, mainly because we want to praise and worship you whilst at the same time we're listening to some biblical teachings 
which you have prepared for us today. I want to pray as a vessel that may you hind me behind the cross so that Christ may be lifted up and all men in this room may be drawn unto you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The title of my sermon is Grow in the Christian Worldview. Grow in the Christian what? Christian Worldview. This title suggests that uh, it is possible for people to call themselves Christians. But whilst they are Christians, they are not growing. Are we together? Their experiences with Christ are stagnant. What they used to be when they were baptized can be the same with what, what they are today. And the word grow is a command, it's an imperative. It's something which we need to do as Christians. What are we growing into in the Christian worldview? The way we understand everything is supposed to be directed and guided by Christ himself. Are we together, saints? So we need to grow in the Christian worldview. Now, when we study the book of Philippians, the background, you discover that Philippians is an epistle which is part of the prison epistles that were written by Christ, by, by Paul, when he was in Rome. So he wrote the book of Ephesians, he wrote Colossians, he wrote Philemon. And then lastly, he also wrote Philippians. All these are prison epistles. The reason why Paul wrote the book of Philippians was because he wanted to show his appreciation for the gifts that he received from the Philippians which they brought to him through Epaphroditus. So when he came, he fell sick. Number one, he wanted to appreciate what they had given him. Number two, he wanted to explain the health condition of Epaphroditus. And at the same time, he wanted to prepare a way for Timothy to visit them so that they would receive him. And the theme that we find in this book is about thankful joy under whatever circumstances. Are we together, saints? That is why at one point, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say what? Rejoice. He also talks about contentment. I can do all things through Christ. When you study the context of that text, you will discover that it was about contentment. So it's about thankful joy under whatever circumstances. And then now Paul, Paul writes this first chapter. He's praying for them, number one, that God would keep them in what they had believed. And then number two, he mentions another prayer which we find in our preaching text this morning, which begins from verse 9 to verse 11. And when we study this text in particular, you will find that Paul acknowledges, number one, that the Philippians already loved God. Are we together, saints? Verse 9 says, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge, and in all discernment. The Philippians already subscribed to the notion of Christianity. They had accepted Christ as their personal savior. So Paul acknowledges that, number one, they already loved God. They already had a personal relationship with Christ as individuals. How do you get the sense? 
But whilst Paul acknowledges this fact, he also has another desire that these people should grow in knowledge and in all discernment. Which means that it is very important for Christians to grow in what? Number one, in knowledge. Let me say I don't intend to preach. Since it is education day, I intend to teach. Now, knowledge is information. An ignorant person goes to school, begins to learn the ABCs of education all together. There is knowledge that is being imparted in that person. God expects that we grow in our knowledge about Christ. At one point we were baptized, we were convicted of sin, and we believe that Jesus is the savior of the world. It's not only about uh, the emotions that we got or the conviction that we got, but there is something that is known as spiritual growth. There is a need for us to grow in knowledge. That is number one, information. Number two, we need to grow in judgment. And another version was saying, in discernment. And as far as I'm concerned, we live in a world where there is a mixture of good and evil. I heard someone saying at one point, anyone who sends their children at Adventist schools, they are learning from the University of Heaven. And those who send their children at secular universities are sending their children at the University of Good and Evil all together. There is a mixture of good and what? And evil. So for a person to exercise proper judgment or discernment, there is a need for prior knowledge about Christ, particularly when it comes to the aspect of separating good from evil. So Paul, the writer of this epistle, understands the fact of the existence of a mixture of good and evil. And he encourages them to grow in knowledge, number one. He also encourages them to grow in all discernment or judgment. I want to touch only three points, and then we pray. The reasons why we need to abound in knowledge and judgment. So verse number 10 gives us the first point. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve things that are excellent. That is the, first, is the first point. The reason why as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, we need to grow in our knowledge of Christ is so that we can be able to approve things that are excellent. How to get the saints? I speak about the mixture of good and evil. Which means whilst, though, whilst evil seems to be more prevalent than good, we don't need to be confused as long as we are growing in our knowledge of Christ, we will be able to approve things that are excellent or things that are good. In a world where people believe in the theory of evolution, what do you believe about our origins? In a world where people believe that if you get excited, you can just resort to abortion. 
What do you believe about abortion? Are we still together, saints? I said I don't intend to preach. I want to teach. Where there is confusion about music, we should be saying in church, what has God taught you about music? Have you graduated from listening to secular music into listening to Christ in song? Where fashion has become a debatable issue in church, what is your belief? And the, and the council is saying, the reason why we need to grow, we need to grow in knowledge so that we can approve things that, things that are what? That are excellent. In psychology, they talk about a certain concept which they call mass hysteria. And in this notion, decisions are made based on the side which the majority belongs. So if someone is deciding on how to marry, that person does not consider what the Bible says, but he or she considers how the majority are getting into marriage. Are we still together, saints? That's mass hysteria. Whatever the majority is doing, we just follow without even considering the consequences. God says that when it comes to matters of life, there is a need for someone to grow in Christ so that the person will be able to approve things that are what? That are good. Maybe I can just ask a rhetoric question. How are you managing your marriage? Are you following the biblical worldview? or you are following what the majority are doing. But also in psychology, there's another concept which they call the head instinct. I remember when I was in the rural areas, we used to go and eat cattle. And there was another, cat, another cow which we had. For some reason, I don't know whether there were some elections which were done but it was the leader of the group. Whenever it decides to go this way, the rest will follow. How to get the saints? These are not 10 cows. It's only one cow. But it is a leader of a group. So it is possible that in such a time which we live, there are people who have a tendency of following what particular, what a certain influential people are doing. So they go on Facebook, they check what the socialites are wearing nowadays, or whatever they are busy with, and then they copy those things. How to get the sense? And some of the socialites are even educating us through television. What we are watching at home. But the question that I want to leave to you this morning, whatever we are learning in this world, are we following the biblical worldview? Or we are getting our education from the university of good and evil? which denotes confusion. And my appeal is simple. Let us follow what the Bible says. Are we together, saints? Yes. It will protect you, not only from the judgment, but even from the consequences 
of making wrong decisions. So point number one, Paul says that you may approve the things that are excellent. And number two, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Paul says that we need to grow in our knowledge of Christ so that our Christian lifestyle will be characterized by sincerity. In 2011, I accepted Christ as my personal savior in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and so I got baptized, and I was meeting people. During lunch, we would discuss a lot of things, and then they, they introduced something about health reform. I heard about health reform. I saw certain people who were examples when it comes to health reform. They were vegans. Are we together, saints? Now, I'm not trying to, to denigrate vegans. And in that church, a lot of people be, be, be became vegans. After some time, some got ill and they discovered that they were lacking vitamin B12. But one thing that I like about those vegans was, these people were sincere in what they knew before they got ill. How would you get the sense? Sincerity can be done in wrongness or even in rightness. But what is important, are you sincere to the knowledge that you have about Christ? Are you sincere to the principles which are taught by Christ in his holy word? And in this case, sincerity is actually a direct opposite of hypocrisy. I was reading Matthew chapter 5. Chapter 6 is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And I discovered that Christ took some time teaching about hypocrisy. The Pharisees knew a lot of things about God. How do the saints? They believe in keeping the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath. They believe in dietary reform. But Christ says to the people, you have not started yet unless and until your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. So what was the problem with the Pharisees? With all the information they had, they were not sincere in obeying what the Lord said. So what is sincerity? I was reading a, a, a certain dictionary just to check. And it defined sincerity as the quality of being open and truthful. Somebody is honest, is truthful, is genuine, authentic about a particular belief. I wish you to get the sense. And then another statement says, not being deceitful or hypocritical. Maybe let's, let's read Luke chapter, chapter 11. Chapter 11 of Luke. And then we go to verse number 52. And Christ is in the process of rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers. And he says, who to you lawyers? For you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves. And those who were entering 
in you hindered. The lawyers now were people who were educated when it comes to the law. They claimed to, to know everything about God's law. In fact, the Pharisees, they believed in uh, this idea of separating themselves from the crowds. So they would have their own communities. And in those communities, the lawyers who were educated became leaders and teachers of the law. But Christ is saying, they took the key of knowledge. But instead of entering into the kingdom of God, they did not. Are we together, saints? I'm tempted to say, just ask someone next to you, are you sincere in your Christian lifestyle? Yeah, I know that this one is a... Don't answer each other, right? Yes. It's very crazy not to answer, not to respond. But the challenge that we have nowadays is as Seventh-day Adventists, most of us, we are no longer sincere. Identity crisis. Instead of the church converting the world, the world is converting the what? The church. And some of us, we don't even want to be known that we are Seventh-day Adventists. The Bible is saying, God wants us to grow in knowledge of Christ so that we can be sincere in what we believe. And also this growth in the knowledge of Christ can also transform those who are sincerely wrong. How to get the saints? Yes. My experiences in the church has taught me that there are a lot of people whom we worship with every Sabbath. And they are very sincere. But they are sincerely wrong. And through the study of the scriptures, someone needs to transform from being sincerely wrong to being sincerely what? Right. Please don't ask anyone sitting next to you that are you sincerely wrong? Are you together, saints? Yes. And then, so that you may be without offense until the day of Jesus Christ. Which means that we need to be righteous until the day Christ comes the second time. And then our last point is coming from verse 11. So number one, we said that you may approve the things that are excellent. Number two, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Number three, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So the reason why we need to grow also in the knowledge of Christ is so that we may be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Are we together, saints? Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 
16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration. And it is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. What is the reason? So that at the end of the day, a Christian will be entirely transformed. We are going to touch on this one during the afternoon. This text. Filled with good works, the works of righteousness. And the good news is, these works of righteousness are not self, are not, we don't originate them by ourselves. But we get them through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus, when he spoke about the Holy Spirit, he said the Holy Spirit is the teacher. When he comes, he will remind you. He will teach you all things. But it, it gets it get better. He will also empower you to do what is right. Are we together, saints? And then Paul says, the mystery of the gospel, which has been hidden, which has been hidden since the world began, is Christ in you the hope of what? The hope of glory. Which means that Christ dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. And when you read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you will discover that these Gospels, they actually teach about the life of Christ. And we understand that Christ was God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Nothing that we see which is created was not created by him. And then it talks about the incarnation, verse 14 of John. The world became flesh and dwelt amongst us. It is this word which was there to preach the gospel to the poor. Luke chapter 4, we find his job description. He preached the gospel to the poor. He opened the eyes of the blind. He healed the sick. Delivered the captives from oppression of demons. He was there to liberate the minds of the people. All these are the works of what? Of righteousness. Which means that when you talk about Christian education, Jesus is the great exemplar. All together, saints. Studying the four Gospels, we need to learn about Christ. We need to imitate the life of Christ. We need to adjust and adapt our lives to the great standard who is Jesus Christ himself. And then we also need to practice what Christ teaches us. And the transformation of the heart is not our duty. It is the duty of the Holy Spirit. So as I conclude my sermon this, let me say afternoon, God wants us to be able to approve things that are excellent. Are we together, saints? Yes. In a world full of confusion, God is saying, educate yourself from the Bible. During the afternoon, I will broaden education a little bit, but you'll discover that the basis of education is the Bible itself. God is saying, be sincere in your Christian work. Don't be deceitful. Be genuine. Be truthful. Don't be ashamed 
of being a Seventh day Adventist. And God is also saying, you need to abound when it comes to the fruits of righteousness, which are the works. And love is the fruit of the Spirit. Its origins are from Christ through the Holy Spirit. I don't know what we had when I was teaching, stroke preaching, but what I was trying to say, we need to be real Christians. Are we together, saints? And someone is saying, Father, by myself, I'm not in a position to do this. I've read about Paul, a very sincere Christian, until he suffered martyrdom. I read about Peter, I read about, about John. When I compare myself to all these people, I realize that I'm different. I don't have the power. I need your help this afternoon. May you kindly assist me to have proper discernment to approve that which is excellent, to be sincere until Christ comes, and to abound when it comes to the works. If there is someone who says, Lord, I need your help, I want to surrender myself into your arms this afternoon. If, if there is anyone with such a prayer, I request that you kindly stand up so that we can pray together and God will empower us. Transformation is not self-derived. Are we together, saints? Transformation is obtained from the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So if there's anyone before I pray, Lord, I want to, I want to surrender myself to start afresh, to walk with you as a sincere Christian. If there's anyone with such a prayer, kindly stand to your feet so that we can pray. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender all oh, to him I freely give. Trust in him daily give. I surrender, I surrender all oh, 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 I surrender all oh, oh, to thee. My blessed Savior, I surrender all. Father in heaven, we want to thank you, mainly because your mercies endure us forever. We want to thank you for the sermon. We want to thank you for the conviction that we got from the Holy Spirit. We also want to thank you for using your vessel. And I want to pray, dear Father, that as your church have chosen to surrender their lives unto you, you know their point of need. You know where they are struggling. May you kindly assist them so that they can be true Christians according to the proper definition that we get from the Bible. 
I know that you know their point of need. I know that you know where it's itching. And I'm offering this prayer, Father, that may you assist them, empower them, transform their hearts where they feel they've already been defeated. May you transform their minds and change their worldview entirely and help them to subscribe to the biblical worldview. And when all is said and done, may you help us to be sincere Christians so that when Christ comes the second time, he will find us without offense, mainly because we are going to grow in imitation, adaptation, and practicing the life of Christ, abounding in good works, mainly because Christ will, de will dwell in us, who is the hope of glory. This is our humble prayer that we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.